Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut. This is going to be one of my full-length episodes, that is to say, one particular topic and not associated with any new bulletins or anything like that, just a general subject. And I don't release these that often anymore. Mostly I do the bulletins, but you're going to enjoy a pretty in-depth episode here and I hope you like it. But before I get on to that, just need to quickly let all of you know that once again, my final event for the tour in North America, at least until November, is going to be here in Denver. Well, actually, I'm in Colorado Springs, but close enough. It's going to be at the Westminster Rec Center, and that is, again, uh, a suburb of Denver, and all the information will be in the description. It's $10 in advance, $15 at the door, and also, if you would like to contribute to this tour to make the rest of it possible, especially a European leg that I would really like to make happen. Well, all of that's in the description as well. Okay, enough of that. Let's get on to the topic at hand. You know, when I want to make a really interesting episode, something that I enjoy turning to, a source that always provides really interesting information, is the NIAC, the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts. And the most recent one has an especially interesting project. Again, NASA is really starting to aggressively pursue nuclear propulsion, the one that they're working on the most aggressively now now is probably the easiest method of nuclear propulsion, and that's nuclear thermal, which just superheats the propellant with a nuclear reaction, therefore making it travel a lot more quickly than propellant from a conventional rocket. The faster your propellant is leaving the nozzle, the more thrust you get, the more ISP you get, etc., and therefore the better performance. However, nuclear thermal propulsion at best is going to provide maybe two or three times the capability of chemical rockets. But in the NIAC, there is another project that is looking at the possibility of a propulsion system, again, using fission, not fusion. In other words, a nuclear reaction that we are very familiar with that can achieve vast speeds. We're talking four to five percent of the speed of light. And at full speed, this is fast enough to traverse the distance from Earth to Mars in a mere 90 minutes, or perhaps even a bit less than that. Now, getting to Mars in an hour and a half for an unmanned spacecraft may be a lot easier than you might think, as long as you can deliver the kinds of g-forces necessary to accelerate to the kinds of speeds we've been talking about, that is to say maybe about 4% of the speed of light, you can arrive at Mars, assuming that we're at the closest point possible, the shortest distance between Earth and Mars, the right time of year that is, in a very short amount of time. For example, the spacecraft involved in the HARP project, which was setting about to launch spacecraft into orbit utilizing colossal artillery pieces, achieved G-forces of around 3,000 Gs and still were able to survive relatively intact and functioning. Let's say we accelerate our ship at about 300 Gs and decelerate at the same amount. What that does is it achieves a maximum velocity of about 4.2% of the speed of light, at least at its peak performance, and a total amount of time of only 2.39 hours passes between here to Mars. So you're not coming anywhere close to the speed of light, it's the acceleration that's literally tearing you apart during this process. But again, an unmanned ship, in theory, could achieve these 
these kinds of velocities and these kinds of transit times between Earth and Mars. But how the hell do you get up to these kinds of speeds and maintain it? Well, we're going to get to that in just a moment. Now, let's talk a little bit about arriving at Mars without ripping your human passengers to pieces. Let's say that you have a ship that can perhaps achieve about 2 G's worth of constant acceleration. It would be uncomfortable, but if you do it for a short enough amount of time, your passengers might be able to survive intact. Even at that relatively modest amount of acceleration, you can travel from Earth to Mars in a mere 29.31 hours. Unbelievable, just a little bit more than a day. And once again, just by maintaining about 2 G's worth of acceleration heading out, achieving your maximum velocity, then turning the ship around and applying force in the opposite direction in order to slow down. Very impressive indeed. But once again, how are we going to maintain these types of accelerations? Well, one method is Project Orion. We've talked about this a number of times in the past. Detonating small hydrogen bombs against a pressure plate behind your ship and the colossal explosive force drives your vessel up to relativistic speeds, approximately 10% of the speed of light and certainly providing a hell of a lot of g-force in the process, assuming you can detonate the bombs rapidly enough, get a rapid enough cadence that is. However, if you don't want to detonate nuclear bombs while traveling from one planet to another, there's an alternative form of nuclear propulsion which, although pretty dangerous, at least is a little less radical than exploding nuclear bombs behind your ship. And by the way, NIAC has all kinds of amazing programs that have been funded by NASA, including things like a nuclear South Pole oxygen pipeline pipeline, biomineralization enabled self-growing building blocks for habitat outfitting on Mars, a great observatory for long wavelengths, and something called Titan Air, leading edge liquid collection to enable cutting edge science. But included in these projects is something called the Aerogel Core Fission Fragment Rocket Engine. Now, fission fragmentation propulsion is actually something that's been around for a very long time. The whole idea is to use a fission reaction to create highly energized and ionized plasma. And ionized means that it can be controlled by electromagnetic forces and then drive it out the nozzle at very high speeds. We're talking about 4 to 5% of the speed of light. And if your propellant is leaving the nozzle that fast, you can ultimately achieve speeds as high as 4 to 5% of the speed of light, assuming that you have enough propellant. But there have been problems with the fission fragmentation rocket engine in the past. One significant problem is the heat of the reaction. If you want to heat up your fuel to a high enough temperature in order to produce the high energy plasma needed, your heat of your reactor core is going to be insanely high, so high that no material could possibly contain it. However, there are some solutions to all of this, one of which you're looking at right now. The idea is to rotate your fuel through the core of the reactor with limited amounts of fuel being exposed to the heat at any given time, therefore heating up only a limited amount of fuel at a time. So although some of the particles are very, very hot, the overall heat of the fuel and therefore the overall heat of the reactor is kept to a temperature of perhaps a few thousand degrees instead of millions of degrees as can be the case in a full-fledged fission reaction that's out of control. If you do this, then you can suspend the ionized particles in a magnetic field, creating what's called a dusty plasma bed reactor. And again, these ionized particles can be released in a controlled and constant flow, generating constant thrust. We're talking about ISPs as long as a million seconds, whereas conventional rocket engines can only maintain ISPs for anywhere from 
380 to maybe 500 seconds at most. Now, one way to increase your thrust and reduce the amount of nuclear fuel that you'll require for this rocket is to inject an inert gas into the fission fragmentation beam. That's something called an afterburner using liquid hydrogen. By the way, I have a paper that covers all of this in great detail linked in the description if you're interested. But if you introduce this type of afterburner, you would be able to achieve substantially more thrust with a lot less ISP. But when it comes right down to it, you don't need a million seconds worth of ISP when you're traveling at this kind of velocity. In that case, you could have about 16 and a half tons worth of total propellant, only a quarter of a metric ton being nuclear fuel. This would significantly reduce the amount of nuclear fuel you would require in order to achieve a very high amount of thrust and extremely high delta V. Now, if you're curious as to what this thing would look like and how it would be designed, well, there it is. A very large amount of the ship is dedicated towards heat radiators because this kind of fission reaction would generate a tremendous amount of heat and you would have to dispose of that. Also note that the inflatable crew habitat massing about 60 tons is located at the opposite end of the ship from where the engine is because after all a fission fragmentation engine is essentially dumping enormous amounts of nuclear waste into the universe behind the ship so you want to keep the crew as far away from that reaction as possible however that being said the proposed bigelow 2100 inflatable habitat yes bigelow is out of business but the technology still remains constant and viable, well, that's an enormous amount of space. We're talking 2,250 cubic meters, or double that of the interior of Starship, located at the front of the ship. So an enormous amount of habitable space, certainly large enough for dozens of crew members or colonists in the future. And if you're making the transit in only a couple of days, you could probably put hundreds of people inside 2100 cubic meters, which is substantially more volume than a Boeing 777, which can handle over 360 passengers. Once again, if you don't have to carry large amounts of supplies and you don't have to have large amounts of habitable space for your passengers because they're only going to be in transit for a couple dozen hours maybe at most, well, that changes everything and it makes the prospect of quickly colonizing the red planet very viable indeed. And once again, using technology that we currently employ right now. Nothing involved in this design involves technology or science that's beyond our comprehension at all. So in NASA's recent funding round, they have employed a company called Positron Dynamics who are planning to make fission fragmentation rocket engines a lot more efficient and a lot easier to build by means of an aerogel propellant. Here's what they have in mind, quote, to address the urgent need for advanced propulsion solutions, we propose the development of a nuclear fission fragment rocket engine that is exponentially more propellant efficient than rocket engines currently used to power today's space vehicles and could achieve very high specific impulse, about 100,000 seconds, and high power density. Current proposed designs for fission fragment rocket engines are prohibitively massive, which is true, have significant thermal constraints, or require implementing complex designs such as the dusty plasma levitation, which I was talking about earlier, which limits near-term viability. We propose to develop a small prototype low-density nuclear reactor core and convert the nuclear energy stored in fissile material into high-velocity rocket exhaust and electrical power for spacecraft payloads. The key improvements over previous concepts are, number one, embed the fissile fuel particles in an ultra-low-density aerogel matrix to achieve a critical mass assembly, and two, to utilize recent breakthroughs in high-field, high-temperature superconducting magnets to constrain fission fragment trajectories between moderator elements to minimize reactor mass. The aerogel matrix and high magnetic field allows for fission fragments to escape the core while increasing conductive and radiation
radiative heat loss from the individual fuel particles. The FFRE propulsion system could provide Delta V to reach the SGL or solar gravitational lens in less than 15 years. The whole idea, by the way, is to utilize the solar gravitational lens to create sort of a super telescope, something that would be beyond our technology currently because it is so damn far away. We're talking a distance of 550 astronomical units, almost 82 billion kilometers, or over a thousand times as far as the distance from Earth to Mars, at least at time of closest approach. That being the case, then, you're looking at a ship that could reach a location a thousand times as far away as Mars in 15 years, making the prospect of arriving at Mars in the space of just a couple of days or perhaps only a few hours very feasible indeed. And once again, NASA is putting their funding behind this because they feel that it is achievable in a realistic amount of time. It's hard to say what's going to happen in the future, but nevertheless, given the fact that we are looking at these kinds of velocities, this kind of delta V, these kinds of distances traversed in a reasonable amount of time, utilizing today's technology, well, it's very exciting indeed. By the way, all of these animations you've been watching up to this point, most of them are created by a friend of mine named Fragomatic. He creates the most amazing animations, which by the way, oftentimes include explanations of the technology and spacecraft that they depict. And I've only included small fragments of these animations. If you want to see the whole thing, you need to visit his channel and of course, subscribe to it as well. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe. Once again, very important to the success of my channel. And also please check the description for various ways to support this content so I can keep bringing it to you. And as always, stay angry about space.